Hi, I'm Christopher Scott, author, speaker, and host of the Christopher Scott Show Talk Radio podcast. You can find that podcast on most podcast players on YouTube and at the ChristopherScottShow.com. That's ChristopherScottShow.com. Today I want to talk about the podcast that I covered over the five last five weeks and put it all together in kind of one quick summary of Common Sense by Thomas Paine. If you've been listening, you know that each week for the past five weeks, I've been taking a different section of the book and kind of talking through each of those sections, at least the big big bullet points from each of those sections and kind of describing what it is that he was talking about. Today, I want to put all that together and kind of give you one kind of brief summary of the, of the whole book. For the sections that I'm going to be reading, I'll be reading some of Common Sense by Thomas Paine. If you ever tried to read it, you know that it was written in Old English and it's nearly impossible to understand. And because of that, I'll be reading from the translated version, rewritten in modern English. If you want to fully understand Common Sense by Thomas Paine, the modern English version is by far the best way to read it. If you're interested in that full text, it's available in ebook, print, or if you prefer, it's available in audiobook. I'll put the links to that, the Amazon links, in the show notes below. And if you'd like to get a free audiobook version of that, you can get it free with a free Audible trial. Both are free. And you can get the Common Sense audiobook for free when you sign up for that Audible trial. I'll put the link to that in the show notes below also. I'd also like to invite you to check out the book on commonsense.com. There are articles, information, and the links to all the other podcasts you can go check out there. So I began this little series by talking about why common sense was so important. The book at its core was a call for independence from Britain. Why would anybody care about that now? Why would it still be relevant today? I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. But here's the thing. If you look back at the history of that time, you know that the Declaration of of Independence had already been signed and the Revolutionary War was well underway. So why would a book making a call for independence be so important? If the Declaration of Independence was already signed and the Revolutionary War was already underway, why why would this book be needed in the first place? Why would there need to be a call for action and this call for independence? Well, the answer to that is that the country was very divided. About half the country, a lot of people don't know this, half the country didn't want independence from Britain. They viewed that the relationship with Britain offered safety and security that the country otherwise wouldn't have, and they wanted to remain loyal to Britain. So here you had a country, our country, at war on our own soil, and half the country was supporting the other side. Thomas Paine was able to use logic and reason, also known as common sense, to bring unity to the country and rally people around this call for independence. The way that Thomas Paine dealt with the issue of division was in itself amazing and something that we can absolutely learn from today. As a matter of fact, it's a a big reason why I work so hard to promote it. Look at the division in this country going on right now and the damage that it's causing. And I think it's very important that people be able to move back to a point of logic and reason and bring unity under that that same principle. So he begins the, the book with a letter, the introduction to the book, if you will, is written as a letter, and he says in in that, and here's how he starts the book, to my fellow Americans, not everyone will agree with the principles outlined in this book, right? So he's acknowledging in the very first sentence that there's this division in the country. Then he says that may be because things have been wrong for so long that people have come to accept it as normal, meaning that people don't remember the way things should be. And then he says some people might be reluctant to accept these principles since it defies the normal. Eventually, however, the truth always prevails. He's acknowledging, he's validating the other side of the argument. That's pretty miraculous when you think about it in today's age of finger pointing and name calling. The other thing that I, I found remarkable about this work by Thomas Paine is his strength of character. And he talked about it, not his strength of character, but character and moral values uh, in general. And he said, when people depart from moral values, 
they tend to make poor decisions. It's evident from the way you have stayed out of this matter that politics is not your place. Whether or not you think of it as a jumble of good and bad put unwisely together, the conclusions you've come to are unfair and unjust. This is why strength of character is important. Thomas Paine realized this. And he didn't have a publisher, by the way. As a matter of fact, he might have been the first viral self-publisher. But there he was acknowledging the, the importance of people using a foundation of moral values even in political decisions. He knew there was a need to provide leadership in the form of a well-reasoned argument. And he didn't sit back complaining and pointing fingers. He took action. His strongest warning was the people who don't take a stand. He said it's the moderates, because of their lack of careful consideration, who will cause more harm to America than the other two kinds of men. Fascinating when you think about that. At its core, common sense was about freedom and independence from Britain. But he also wanted peace. This was not a call to war. He specifically said it. He said, our desire has remained consistent to find endless and uninterrupted peace. This is why we look beyond the burdens of today. He knew he was asking people to make a sacrifice, and he reasoned this by saying, all that I have laid out will be difficult for some people to accept. But as with all the other steps we have taken, the discomfort will eventually pass. In time, it will become comfortable. And when we have our independence, the country will be glad we did what needed to be done. Ah, there's a ton about what could be said about logic and reason and and common sense and critical thinking. All that's all philosophical stuff. There's a there's a whole detailed outline of this philosophy in the book on common sense. You can also find that at the book on common sense.com. I'm not going to get into that here, but there is one point worth mentioning. Throughout common sense, Thomas Paine explained why. He explained it with every point. He did it in simple terms that people could understand. And this was very powerful. Look at what happens today. How many times do we hear politicians say, oh, it's very complicated? As if the general public's too stupid to understand. This isn't the case. It's just that too many arguments have moved to, to a level of complexity that doesn't make any sense to the average person. It's impossible to support what we don't understand. Confusion creates conflict. Remember, Wise men make complicated matters simple, and fools make simple matters complicated. There's a a bunch of reasons why common sense is still relevant today. It addresses the issue of a divided nation. It calls on the strength and character of the people and leaders. And it demonstrates logic and reason as a path to peaceful conflict resolution. These are timeless principles that are as important today, if not more important today than they've ever been. Probably the most insightful part of the book is the expose that he does on the origin of government, God and politics, and what a proper healthy government should look like. This this section, which is titled of monarchy and hereditary succession. I don't think that the title to this section really does it justice. What he's really talking about is the origin of government, God and politics, and what a proper healthy government should look like. And he begins this section by saying, men were originally created equal, and that quality could only be destroyed by some subsequent circumstance, that some people are rich and some people are poor is explainable, even though it follows misery and oppression. Selfish preservation is what keeps a man from being so poor he's destitute. But it's also what makes him fearful of taking the risks needed to be wealthy. In other words, everybody's born with the same natural rights. And it's personal decisions that are what determines a person's wealth. And I think he was also laying the groundwork there to say, hey, don't be afraid of taking on independence. It will be good for you in the long run. Then he says, in the early ages of the world, this is great, in the early ages of the world, according to biblical history, there were no kings. As a result, there were no wars. The pride of kings that throws humankind into confusion and chaos. Holland, which doesn't have a king, has enjoyed more peace for this last century than any of the monarchical governments in Europe. A look back on history supports this argument. 
The first patriarchs had happy, quiet, rural lives that vanished with the arrival of Jewish royalty. Powerful statements that he's making there. All this assumes the idea that kings have some noble, honest origin, when more than likely, if we were to trace the monarchy back to its origins, we'd find that it all began with a gang of thieves who wanted to increase their power and ability to take more. They probably saw an opportunity to offer safety to quiet and defenseless people in exchange for frequent contributions back to them. In other words, that was the forming of government, gangs of thieves that set up taxes, if you will, that offered safety and protection to people that didn't necessarily need it, but they sure convinced them that they did. What does any of this have to do with today? Well, the answer lies in another question. What's the difference between an oppressive government Regardless of whether it, whether, whatever kind it is, whether it's a king, a dictatorship, or even a, a democracy, if the results are the same, what makes a government oppressive? Isn't the answer a government that's involved in all areas of personal lives? Doesn't that start with a belief that somehow government is the answer to problems, whether it's safety and security or benefits or whatever the case might be, and whatever form that government takes? Then there, there's one of the points that this all started with. Who's responsible for a destructive government? Couldn't you make the argument that it begins when people look to government to solve problems? Isn't that the origins of, of an oppressive government when people start to rely on government instead of themselves and their creator? That the downfall of government begins with the downfall of society? That's a few of the highlights from Common Sense. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Common Sense, the book, or other articles and podcasts about Common Sense, visit the book on commonsense.com.